Hey folks, good to see you, kind of, or maybe good to be seen. Maybe that's the way to say it this morning. But I will tell you that this morning is a fantastic morning. And the reason that it's a fantastic morning is that it's Mother's Day. Now, many of you have had moms where you experienced them serving you in pretty significant ways. Uh, You can maybe remember in your earliest of memories what it looked like to ask your mom for something and she went out of her way to make sure that you got what it is that you needed, or at the very least, what you wanted. I know certainly in our house, uh, our kids when they were younger were not afraid to ask for things from Janet. Whether that be, can you change the DVD? Yes, we lived in the era where kids grew up with DVDs. Uh, Can you do this or can you do that? Mom, I'm hungry. Mom, I want this. Mom, I'm bored and all these other kinds of things. And Janet was instinctively, I think, uh, as just an incredible mom, being able to come in and serve and meet those needs. Moms serve. It's what they do. It it seems to be something that's very natural to them. My mother-in-law is very much like that as well. She serves, as a matter of fact, uh, for her, serving means meals. And and so if mom is unable to provide a meal for us as a family unit, uh, it kind of takes something out of her. And so I just really appreciate moms. And my own mom uh, served in in ways that, that are just difficult to express sometimes, you know, the things that she would try to accomplish for us when we were younger. We are talking about serving this morning, and specifically when we look at this idea of binging. We binge on so many different kinds of things. I binge. Yesterday, I was binging on working on my deck because it was just fun, and it was just nice to come to a place and, and, and just complete something. Uh, so binging is something that we regularly do, and binging is not necessarily a bad thing. Often when we use the term binge, we use it in, in, a, in a way that did indicates that something negative is taking place, but I want to let you know this morning that binging is not necessarily negative, unless, of course, you're binging on negative things. So this morning, we're going to talk about binging on serving. So if you have your Bibles with you, I want you to turn to the Gospel of Mark. Uh, Mark is a fantastic gospel. Mark is uh, believed to be the John Mark that we read about later in the scriptures. And Mark is also believed to have transcribed this from Peter. And so Peter was dictating, Mark is writing it down. And in chapter 10, verses 42 to 45, we find Jesus makes some pretty profound, uh, significant statements that are counterculture. Uh, they are not the way that our world typically functions. And so Jesus is calling us into something that is uncomfortable, that is good, that is amazing. Here's what we got. Mark chapter 10, verse 42 to 45. If you do not know where the gospel of Mark is, in the beginning of your Bible, there's a table of contents. People worked really hard to put it there. Don't be ashamed to use it. And one of the ways we like to show respect for God's word is we do like to stand for the reading of his word. So as weird and strange as it may feel, stand up and let's honor and respect God's word this morning. Here's what it says. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave to all, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom to many. Let's pray together. Lord God, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for your example uh, to us in how to live. Lord, as we consider what it means for you to be fully God, fully man, Lord, that the fully man means that we are able to pattern our lives after you. And so as we do that this morning, and as we talk about what it means to be more like you in binging on serving, Jesus, I pray that you will help us to have eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that are open to you. Lord God, I also pray for those who have had difficult weeks, that they would find rest and encouragement and and joy this morning, refreshment as we engage together. Lord, I pray for those people who have had great weeks, and I ask, Lord, that you would help them to celebrate and to be an encouragement to the people around them so that we can reach our spheres of influence for your sake. In your holy and precious name I pray, amen. 
Well, you can have a seat at home uh, if you ha- were standing, and if you weren't standing, well, that's okay. You know, I won't shame you. It's okay. I wouldn't know it anyway. Uh, let's, let's talk about this passage. Now, this passage of Scripture is a very unique passage, and the reason it's a unique passage is because we actually have a request from James and John, two of Jesus' disciples, who come to Jesus, and, and imagine asking God, Jesus, this question. They come to him, and they say, you ready? We want you to do for us whatever we ask. We want you to do for us whatever we ask. That is actually in verse 35. Now, think about that for a second. You're coming to God Almighty, God in the flesh, and you're coming to him, and you're saying, okay, God, Jesus, we want you to do for us whatever it is that we ask. Who is the focus of that statement? Where is the emphasis being placed? Is the emphasis placed on Jesus being honored and glorified? Is the emphasis being placed on uh, others? Or is the emphasis being placed on self? And that is sets the stage for the rest of this conversation. James and John come, and they say, we want you to do for us whatever it is that we ask. And if we're going to be really honest, I think sometimes our prayers are like that. Hey, God, I've been a Christian for so and so many years. Uh, You you should give me what I ask, because I've been faithful to you. Or, uh, God, I believe that you are the God who gives everything, and so you should just give me what I ask. And it's this presumption that God's thought, his desire, is to meet every one of our wants, our whims, whatever it is that we ask. I find it interesting that the response to them, though Jesus knowing all things, he says to them in verse 36, What do you want me to do for you, he asked. So, Lord, give us whatever it is that we ask. He says, okay, what are you asking for? What do you want? And then they go and they ask this. They said, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. And then Jesus says, you have no idea what you are asking for. I mean, you're asking for something huge. You're asking for something big. And you're asking for something that you haven't even got a clue about. When I come into my glory, do you even know what it's going to look like? And Jesus says to them, essentially, that exact thing. Do you even know what this is going to look like? He says, can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Are you inaugurated in the same way that I am? I'm in the Garden of Gethsemane. I've got this cup that I need to be drinking from so much so that it creates anguish and anxiety within me that I ask the Father, if any other way can be taken, can this cup be passed on? And so what he's saying is is that there's a road that I'm on that I'm not confident or that I know you're not ready for. And the evidence of that is actually in the simplicity of their answer to him when he asks this question. He says, we can. And this youthful enthusiasm comes forward. We can do all of these things, Jesus. Absolutely, yeah. If If we get your left and right hand when you're in glory, we can do anything. Yeah, anything but stay put and not get scattered when the Romans come to grab Jesus, right? Or the, the Sanhedrin actually comes to grab Jesus. They scatter. Jesus says to them, You will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at the right or the left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. And when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together together. And so he begins to address the entire group. And in addressing the entire group, he calls them to something greater. He says, you know that those who are regarded as rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. In other words, don't be like the world. Don't be like the Gentiles. I got something different for you, something better, something more holistic. And he says... Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And that's countercultural. Typically, the idea is if you want to become great, you've got to become the best. And he's saying, no, you want to become great, you've got to serve. Whoever wants to be first must be the slave to all. 
For even the Son of Man did not come to be served. Now, if anybody deserved to be served, was it not Jesus? I mean, he had that place already. And he says of himself, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. As a ransom for many. For many, you see, the, the one who stands tallest in the kingdom of heaven is the one who recognizes their humility as they stand before the king of heaven. The one who considers others better than themselves, the one who seeks to serve, not to be served, the one who looks and loves and lives like Jesus. And so we can sum that up with this. Are you ready? This is big. If you're going to remember anything, this is what I want you to remember. You will find your life. When you lose it, you will find your life when you give it away. That's the idea here. That's, that's the big picture thinking here. You will find your life when you give it away. If you self-focus, if everything is about you, it's about your problems, it's about your desires, it's about your insecurities, it's about your wants and all these other things. If it's all about you, then you will be trapped and caught in that ditch, that pit of despair, you could say. But you will find your life when you give it away. When you give it away. Mother Teresa said it this way. She says, we are all pencils in the hands of a writing God who is sending love letters to the world. What a great image. We are all pencils in the hand of a writing God who is sending love letters to the world. Mother Teresa chose a life of calling not to be served, but to serve. She went on to live like Jesus, or she wanted to live like Jesus, and so she chose to serve amongst the poorest in Calcutta in India. Now, that's not necessarily the calling for every single one of us. My question to you is this. In your home, in your workplace, in your friendship circles, in all of your circles of influence, are you a server? Do you serve? You see, at this juncture in the disciples' lives, they hadn't gotten it yet. They, they weren't fully grasping what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. They were proud to be following in the footsteps of the rabbi. They hadn't made a shift, though, from hearing his teachings to living out his teachings. And they were kind of like these two shipwrecked men in a lifeboat. From their end of the boat, the two watched it watched the other end of the boat who people were frantically trying to bail water because there was a hole on their end of the boat. And the one actually looks to the other and he says, man, thank the Lord that we're not on their end of the boat. Look, the reality is that the boat is sinking. It's easy to say that it's someone else's job to do something, but this shift in life that Jesus is calling us into begs that each person asks the question, what is my job? Where should I be serving, and am I doing it? Am I doing it? Jesus said in John 12, 26, whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will also be. My father will honor the one who serves me. And so it really could be said that following Jesus requires serving. It requires serving. Now, before we get misunderstandings coming this way, serving Jesus is something that is supposed to bring life and joy to who you are, to your spirit, to your soul, to who you are. So we're not talking about obligation. We're talking about a heart orientation that shifts away from me towards him, towards the people that he desires us to reach. And there's joy in that. There's excitement in that. It's not that it's always easy, but there's joy and excitement in it. Serving is not a burden. And if you are in this place, this mentality of being where serving is a burden to you, then i got two questions for you that you got to answer. Number one, are you serving in the place that Jesus is calling you to serve? And number two, is your heart right? Is it about you or is it about Jesus and others? Those are two big questions that we need to ask. My Father will honor the one who serves me. So following Jesus requires serving. Somebody actually said it this way. God is, does not ask for your ability or your inability. He asks for your availability. You've heard that before. But it's absolutely true. I mean, think about Moses, for example. Moses was a guy who tried everything not to serve 
the Lord, right? You remember what he says? He says, look, I, I can't speak. I stutter. I'm not good in front of groups of people. I, I don't have everything that I need. And, and God systematically answers every single one of those things. Why? Because he wanted Moses to serve into his calling. You see, there's no greater joy than serving in your calling. First uh, Peter uh, says it this way, First Peter 4.10, each of you, so that's every single person, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. Now listen, as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. And so because God's graced you, uh, because you are forgiven, and because he has blessed you with a unique ability to be able to interact with the world around you, whether that's through the church or outside the church, we are called to be a people who serve using the gift that we've been given. Everyone's been given a gift. You have been given a gift, and you need to know that unique gift that you have been given, that is for you. Nobody else can do what you were called to do. And God wants to raise you up in order to be able to accomplish the things for his kingdom that he wants you to serve in. Galatians 6, 9 and 10 says it this way. Let us not, in the event that we're ever tired, because believe me, sometimes serving people can be tiring. It, so I've actually heard somebody say it this way, ministry would be amazing if it wasn't for the people. Now, truth is, is that I love serving the people we serve. But sometimes it's difficult, not necessarily because of them, but sometimes but often just because of my own physical limitations and my ability to be able to accomplish those things. And then I read a passage like this, and I find it to be an encouragement not to give up. It says this, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, as the opportunity arises, we could say, as we create opportunity, as we hear about opportunity, as we meet a person, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Ephesians 2 verse 10 says it this way, it says, for we are all God's handiwork, right? So we're created by God, we're created in Christ Jesus, listen, to do good works. Why are we created in Christ Jesus? We're created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And here's the exciting part, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So God already knows what he wants you to do. And he wants you to do it. What is my job? And am I doing it? Ken Harvey, in his book, Seismic Shifts, writes this. He says, picture a church in which everyone wants to be served. Each person believes the church exists to meet their needs. It makes them happy and to cater to their whims and tastes. Now, I don't know about you, but I actually find that pretty convicting because I got my preferences, uh, I got my whims, I got my tastes. And then he says, imagine a congregation in which everyone has a take care of me attitude and quick to complain whenever things are not the way they feel they should be. Now, sadly, a lot of us don't have to use much of an imagination to figure that one out. That kind of church will never have a positive impact on the world, at least not on purpose. It'll grow small, it'll grow inward, it'll grow unhealthy. Uh, this kind of church does not honor Jesus and bring glory to God at all. This is not a church ruled by a servant spirit. Now imagine a church, and this is the part that gets me jazzed and excited. Imagine a church where every single person has a passion to serve others. What if... We actually adopted Jesus' attitude. What if we actually lived like Jesus lived, who was worthy of being served, chose to serve? And what if our heart's desire is not to have our own needs met, but to actually meet the needs of others? And here's the cool thing about that. As I go about trying to focus on meeting your needs, and you go about the focus of trying to meet my needs, we got each other covered. We turn into this family of believers that we're called into. Think about what God could do with through a group of people who are committed to sacrificial ministry to each other. See a need, fill a need. These people know that the Holy Spirit has given them this unique ability, this spiritual gift that are to be used for the building people up and to bring in glory to God. And so they purposefully 
go about discovering their gifts. So if you don't know what your gift is, this is a starting place. You got to recognize that God has actually blessed you and given you a spiritual gift. And then secondly, you got to figure out what that gift is. Thirdly, you got to use that gift in developing and using it. What could God do with that kind of church? I mean, what could God do if you and I were those kind of followers? Where our heart's desire was to binge on serving like Jesus. What would it be like? What do you think that would do to our spheres of influence, our workplaces, our families, our friendship groups, our acquaintances? What do you think that would do? I mean, imagine, just imagine what that would be like. Uh, it would be the idea of, like, let's say in a battlefield, would we be on the stretcher or would we be carrying it? Look, there's times where each need to be served. I get that. When we're in a place of need, we need to be served. And that's this idea of carrying one another's burdens. But for the most part, most of the time, we are called to serve others. And the bottom line is, is that God wants each of us to help carry other people through their times of need. That's the idea. We carry people in their times of need. The church was never meant to be a bunch of people watching a few exhausted workers strained to carry the burdens of an entire congregation. It's not the way it was. And for some reason, we adopted that model somewhere along the line where the pastor needs to be the one to do all those things or the deacon needs to do it or the elder needs to do it or somebody else. As a matter of fact, we've adopted it so much that you personally might have a passion given to you by God and you'll come to somebody like me who doesn't necessarily have that passion initially. You'll come to me and you'll say, we need to do this can we get that going? Whatever that is. My answer to you is, yeah. And their answer often, or their response usually is, okay, pastor, when are we going to start that? And I'm like, whenever you begin. Because this is God's unique thing for you. We've adopted this idea of handing over our vision to others instead of following through into it ourselves. I'm not called into your vision necessarily. Sometimes I probably will be, but not all the time. If you want to know who should do the things that get you up in the morning, it's you. Do the things that God has called you to. A church filled with people who serve will change the world. Like, there's just, just no other way around it. A church filled with people who serve will change the world. You're serving the church, you're serving your family, you're serving the uh, community at large, you're serving in your workplaces, you're going to change the world. So much so, actually, that, that it'll probably even sometimes come without you realizing it. Some of you are already leaning into this and you don't even realize the impact. And it's kind of like when the disciples came to the Last Supper. They were walking into something and they didn't even realize what they were walking into. So the disciples, they walked in, they had been waiting for the Passover meal, and surprisingly, there was no paid servant greeting them at the door with a basin of water to wash their feet and to refresh them. So they filed in, they hugged, they reclined at the table, and about halfway through dinner, things got weird. You see, earlier Jesus said that, that he came to serve, not be served, right? In John 13, verses 4 and 5, it says this, Jesus, so he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. That's interesting to me. He clearly chose to serve. Luke 22, verse 27, For who is greater, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. And so in other words, even just how we orient our understanding of who is great shifts. Not the one who's being served that is the great one, is the one who is serving that is the great one and the one that we need to esteem. 
Philippians 2, verse 3 to 8, gives us the context in terms of Jesus' mentality in all of this. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, so it's not saying you can't think about yourself, but look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude My attitude, our attitude that we need to encourage and affirm and challenge each other into should be the same as Christ Jesus. Listen, who being the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Does any of this sound like how you and I live life? With that level of humility, with that level of fervor towards serving, excitement towards serving, because this is what we're challenged to walk into. Joshua 24, 15. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, you hear that? If serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. So Joshua here is saying that, that there is serving that's taking place, whether we like it or not, whether we think of it or not. So if serving God seems undesirable to us, then choose this day whom we will serve. And then he goes on, and he says, whether the gods of your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so the idea here very simply is that, listen, you can serve the things of your past. You can serve in the place of your present in terms of where you live and whom everybody else is serving around you. Or you can be like Joshua and his family. We can be like Joshua and his family and serve the Lord. Every day there are people all around us with dirty feet, broken hearts, heavy burdens, and needs that we can help meet. So, how about this? Grab a basin and a towel and start serving like Jesus. How about that? Get up from our tables, grab a basin and a towel, and start serving like Jesus. Not thinking about ourselves, but thinking about others. Now, there's some benefits to serving in the event that some of you are wondering. Uh, Benefits to serving would be things like this. It decreases your stress, actually. Looking for new ways to decrease stress in your life? Well, hey, try serving could be the commercial that we would put forward. We know that it may sound a little odd, but serving is proven to reduce stress, and it's actually noted in a Mayo Clinic's Six Health Benefits of Volunteering article. Through interacting with new people and donating your time to help others, you can develop a new sense of appreciation both for yourself and for other people. So learning to appreciate what you're doing in the life of the community not only decreases your stress, but it teaches you healthy ways to manage your time and your biggest Priorities. Now, here, here's something you need to know. Whenever I experience somebody who's experiencing an awful lot of stress, an awful lot of uh, scenarios in life that, that overcome them, I always encourage them to just one day a week do something for someone else. And the reason behind that is actually really simple. It does decrease our stress. It gives us this momentary lifting of what we're currently focused on so that we can see the needs of others. And I gotta tell you, often when we see the needs of other people, we evaluate life on that basis, and we often find that what we're going through in this momentary time doesn't seem to measure up to what others are going through in terms of the people we desire to serve. Or sometimes it does, even. And it can remind us that that we can still be good to others even in our moment of need, and help them become good to others in their moments of need. But it decreases our stress. Number two, it increases our confidence. Confidence will help us so much with our everyday life. It gives us an extra push to speak up for ourselves, speak up for others, and make bolder decisions with our future. Confidence is a hard skill to develop because it's really rooted, believe it or not, in kindness. 
Having the courage to be kind and help others through serving is a great way to increase your confidence at work, in your family, and with your friends. Confidence. It builds it. Because the more you serve others, the more it becomes just a natural part of who you are, and you lean into it in those times that you need to lean into those things. Number three, it expands your connections, your relationships. If I had to choose one word to describe how serving has affected my life, that word would be community. Not long after I started serving a youth ministry in a church, uh, I was invited to a young marriage group. Janet and I were invited to this young marriage group, and, and one of the other couples that was in that young marriage group happened to also be volunteering in the same youth ministry. And we had some great times together talking about faith and life. We talked about Jesus. We talked about the church. Uh, and I was encouraged in my faith journey because of that group. And even now to this day, there's still some, uh, because there's been a lot of time in between, there's not the same level of connection, but there's still some connection that's there. And that relationship still matters to me. God has used the people I serve with to encourage me. Now, some of you know that firsthand. Some of you have served in groups and developed relationships that you didn't know that you would have. I certainly know that when strangers begin serving together, side by side, there's something unique that takes place that bonds them in a way that other ways don't. So I've, got, I've been experiencing from God the way that he has used people I serve with to encourage me, to pray for me, and to teach me. My relationship with Jesus and others has flourished as a result of serving because it expands my connections and it connects me to others. And it's really a fulfilling of John 17. See, Jesus prays this, this prayer. It's called the high priestly prayer in, in John 17. He prays for God to protect us so that we would be one as the Father and He are one. And this oneness is best experienced in and through participation in life and faith together, and we call that church. By serving and loving one another is another component that comes along with that. So moving forward, I'm going to ask you to ask this of yourself. Am I serving others, or do I expect to be served? A pathway, in terms of our core values, we call this push a broom. Push a broom. If, if pushing a broom is below you, then leadership is above you. You catch that? If pushing a broom is below you, then leadership is above you. And the whole rationale behind that is that we want servant leaders. And so we want our leaders being willing to push a broom, to stack chairs, to do dishes, to shovel driveways. Whatever it is, we serve because he served. So am I serving others or do I expect to be served. Every time you feel that selfish impulse, surrender it to God with a quick prayer and ask him how you can serve him or serve him by serving another person. In addition to this, you may want to sign up to serve in a cause that's even bigger than yourself. And think about that for a second. Join something that's bigger than you and serve in it. How about this for an idea? I know that we can't do this just yet, but as these uh, gathering numbers get lifted and we start being able to gather in larger numbers and there's less anxiety towards these things, how about you take your, uh, this is going to sound weird, all right? I'm just thinking about this on the spot, shooting from the hip, but how about this? What if you took your patio furniture, move it from the backyard to the front yard, put on a pot of coffee, put on a, get a big jug of lemonade and every single person that walks by, offer them a coffee, Offer them some lemonade, some iced tea. Some of you might want to do some watermelon. Whatever it is, reach out. Encourage them. And in your serving, pray for opportunities to talk about your why. I'm doing this because Jesus came to be served. Sorry, came to serve, not be served. And I want to be like Jesus. I want to serve and not be served. What an, what an interesting idea. Can you imagine? I know one street specifically uh, in, in our congregation, I'm not going to name the street, but we've got almost every single house on that street are people from our church. It's almost, it, it would be like a, a, a church potluck almost if everybody did something different on that street. But what if on your street you were the only person 
that said, I want to serve, and I'm going to take my backyard patio furniture, I'm going to put it on my front yard, and see if I can meet the needs or just serve and encourage the people who walk by. Now, some of you can't do that. You live in the country. Some of you live in apartment blocks. Some of you live in areas that that doesn't lend itself to you. To you. So what can you do to serve the people around you? What can you do? Can you send them a quick note? Can you send them a, a, a text message? Can you make a phone call? Can you do a Zoom meeting or Teams or whatever you know, video conferencing that you want to do? What can you do to serve others? Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much that we live in a time where we get to be innovative in what it looks like to serve others for your sake. And so, Jesus, would you give us the ideas where we lack ideas? Would you encourage us from other people's ideas? Jesus, more importantly, would you help us to orient our hearts towards you so that we become more and more like you? Lord, would we not seek only our needs, but also look to the needs of others? Would we remember that we are a serving people, not a served people? Jesus, would we be excited about that? That the opportunities that gives us, Lord, the joy that we experience, the confidence we gain, the relationships that we build, all because we binge on serving. Lord Jesus, if we're going to binge on anything, may we be people who binge on prayer, binge on worship, binge on word, and binge on serving. Because these things, Lord, when we orient our lives towards you, create excitement and faith and create energy for the journey. I thank you, Lord, that you are good and that you go before us already working and we just get to join you in it. And so, Lord God, would you launch us, would you help us to figure out what it looks like for us to serve like you. In your holy and precious name I pray, amen.